This is the Wise Guy Radio Show, a podcast dedicated to educating and inspiring through conversations with today's top talents in the world of glass. This episode of the Glass Blower's Companion is brought to you by the Glass Vegas Expo. Glass Vegas brings together some of the greatest glass artists and industry vendors all under the same roof with a respectable and heartwarming vibe unlike any other functional glass art show out there. With opportunities for artists to sign up for educational seminars, glass competitions, and trades, offering more time to mingle and to share the love of a common interest. Glass Vegas Expo is being held this year, February 7th through the 9th at the Ballery's Resort and Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada. Stay tuned to their website, glass.vegas, for up-to-date COVID-19 protocols. And follow them on Instagram at glassvegasexpo. That's at glassvegasexpo. All one word. This episode is also brought to you by the Orlando Glass Union. Whether you're a traveling artist or love to take classes... The Orlando Glass Union offers a clean, comfortable space with benches to rent and space for classes, which are generally offered on a monthly basis. For more information on available space, classes to sign up for, and much more, go to orlandoglassunion.com. That's orlandoglassunion.com. Hey, 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 hey. What's happening? Welcome to a Glass Blower's Companion, episode number 28. This is your host, Jason Michael, and thanks so much for tuning in today. Uh, it's been a month of Sunday since I have recorded. I apologize for the delays. I have been uh, pretty focused behind the scenes on lots of projects, uh, mainly around making glass stuff in the studio. Uh, I've been renting space over at the Orlando Glass Union for like the last six months or so and have uh, refound my passion and love for making pipes. And because of that, I'm going to Las Vegas this year, which I'm happy to announce. I'll be over in uh, booth A. 426 for those that are going to be there. Um, if you're a smoke shop and you're going to be there, I'd love to come, love to have you stop by and visit and maybe put some stuff in your store. It would be pretty rad. But I'm super excited for this opportunity uh, working with Las Vegas this year, also, um, which I'll get into in a second. Uh, but it's my first tra- time going to a trade show. And for those that have been listening to the show for quite some time, know that I've mentioned over the years I've wanted to go to a trade show, specifically to Las Vegas. Uh, and this year I'm actually going to be there. So uh, if you're if somebody listening to this and you're a glass blower, you're going to be there, uh, let me know. Uh, send me a message on Instagram or uh, what have you. Uh, it would be cool to meet up. And uh, I'm going to have uh, open spots also in times for uh, rec- doing some recording while I'm there, uh, whether it's covering vendors that are in the industry or pipe makers, what have you. Um, so I'm excited to get to get to see people and uh, you know, hug babies and, and and uh, kiss hands, or however you want to call it. <laughs> so, and also, it's going to be potentially a game changer for myself. Uh, not going to put the cart before the horse, but potentially this is going to change a lot as far as my work schedule goes. And I'm just going to leave it at that because I'm not going to say uh, put the cart before the horse. I want to definitely uh, fill you in after Las Vegas on how it went. With that being said, I'm also, uh, this coming week, going to be doing some video recording on the process that I've been going through, as well as the anxiety and the stress uh, going on behind the scenes with myself as I'm preparing uh, with my wife and a little team I have around me, helping me prepare and get ready for the show to make sure that it is successful for us for our first trade show. Just I wouldn't be able to do this without them, and I'm very grateful. And you know, between them putting up with uh, my lack of patience with some things and also just... Uh, having a little burst of freaking out about stuff. <laughs> so it's been a bit, it's been an interesting moments and times here, but I'm going to be uh, doing some video recording and sharing uh, just some of the stuff that I've done, some brain dumps and things that uh, allowed me to really focus on and, and figure out a game plan for the show. So I'm excited to share that. Uh, if you have not yet subscribed to the YouTube channel, you can find it on YouTube. It's uh, just look for Wise Guy TV. I know in the past I talked about getting the Wise Guy TV uh, rolling and Depending on how things go at Las Vegas, uh, I will potentially have uh, more time on my hands to focus on that, as well as this podcast and uh, everything else out there. So, again, stay tuned for more updates. That way I don't jump the gun 
and uh, jinx myself. Speaking of the Glass at Vegas Expo, uh, myself and Mike Shelbo are going to be co-hosting a small event uh, during their educational seminars that uh, Glass Vegas holds every year. This one is called a Glass of 2022, an afternoon with Scott Debbie of Mothership. And uh, Mike and I are going to be asking all kinds of questions and interviewing uh, Scott Deppy uh, about his background, uh, his, his personal life, and what got him into glass, and how he uh, was able to grow Mothership into what it is today. Uh, that's going to be held Monday, February 7th from 3.30 to 5. And then there will be a meet and greet held from 5 to 6. And it's in the Bally's Hotel Palace Meeting Room across from the Glass Vegas registration. If you're not familiar with the space, uh, you can go to glass.vegas for more information on this. So definitely excited to have an opportunity to, I guess, do what I do uh, with the educational stuff and also the interviewing. It's just a pretty sweet opportunity. I'm very excited about it. And also just excited to go into Vegas in general. Never been to Vegas. Uh, haven't actually been west of Colorado. So I'm, my wife and I are having our first trip together to Vegas, kind of a late anniversary trip for us as well. And we're going to get some disc golf in on, let's see, we fly in on the 5th, late on the 6th, we have a day of disc golf. And then uh, the 7th, 8th, and 9th, I'll be slinging glass and not going to be partying too much there. I know like there's a lot of after parties and shows and things that are happening. Um, I'm going to be social during the trade shows itself, during the times, uh, but I'm not going to be getting out too much because I, I definitely want to kind of have this trip be a little bit more conservative for myself uh, just because I want to be super focused on my sales, but also because I want to just make sure that I'm on, I'm on my game, like the top of my game as possible. And with all that being said, today's guest is Ginger Ames. She is a financial life planner and has had her toe in the glass pipe industry for quite some time. Uh, she shares her journey and her story on how she became a glass artist. Uh, also, her background in ceramics and some other fun projects that she's done that were quite successful. But she is a third generation CPA. And uh, because of her background in art and also their background as a CPA, she really wanted to focus on helping the creative out, specifically the pipe makers in the industry. I know a lot of us out there uh, that have the ability to make a ton of money, but don't always work smart with it. And as a financial life planner, she really will help uh, work you through everything you have currently, what you're bringing in, etc., goals and mindsets, and then help plan for the future. Uh, but also talks about which you'll hear actually in this talk. She she asked me some specific questions, which were things I've never shared before. But she will dig down deep and find out kind of some background on your history of your financial mindset. And then through all the things that you talk about, she will then help you put a plan of attack ahead of yourself. Uh, that way you're setting yourself up for retirement. You can get yourself health insurance, all those things that you need uh, to be able to live a long, healthy life and also do what you do for a living for as long as you possibly can. Until one day you decide you want to take a break and retire, you know, and then you'll have several million dollars in a Roth IRA or some kind of retirement plan somewhere uh, that allows you to retire and have a nice life and healthy life and travel and see the world and live your dreams that you've always wanted to live. And uh, other than that, I don't want to ramble on too much. I just want to give you some insights and fill you in on what has been going on. Uh, definitely stay tuned to my Instagram. My personal Instagram is at jmichaelglass. Uh, I am currently uh, really trying to stay on top of all my posting and using all my posts to my advantage by posting a reel every single day, um, which uh, from what I'm understanding with the algorithms, the way Instagram is working, I'm actually getting a ton more uh, likes and follows and views and uh, actual interactions with my Instagram page than I ever have before. Uh, whether it's a picture or a video, you can just throw a, a picture up on a reel for freaking 30 seconds and just have some music playing behind it that's like the most popular song that's being trending right now or whatever and then you can get people to start looking at your shit if you would have issues with that it's something i've been experimenting with but uh lately i've been posting some tutorial stuff and how to's and things i do over at the mouse house and i'm going to be posting more of that but also full-length videos on our youtube channel Again, you can follow me over there on YouTube. Come subscribe, please. I need to get my first 1,000 subscribers on uh, YouTube. That way I can go live. And the live streaming is what I really want to do because it's going to allow me to live stream demonstrations and classes and stuff like that uh, for free for you all. Uh, also, if you want to have a more in-depth personal conversation with myself, uh, relationship sense, as well as our community we have over on Patreon, uh, you can follow me over there as well at patreon.com forward slash wise guy 
media, I think it is. <laughs> I'm not 100%. I can't remember if I changed it or not. It's, um, but you can definitely use the link in the show notes. That will take you there. And for as little as a dollar a month, you can join the community, help support this podcast, and help it uh, grow because I am going to be in the market very soon for an upgrade in all of my equipment. And uh, it's going to cost a ton of money to do that. But I'm doing it because I want to create high-quality content that sounds great, looks great, and is clear and concise. So you learn better. Also, I'm going to be offering some classes at the Orlando Glass Union. We've just been going through a full major rehab in the studio with new ventilation getting added in uh, and some new bench spaces as well. So now the studio has uh, two uh, large hexagon bench tops for students to work on. And then in between the two, there is a central uh, table bench for the teacher. And I'm going to be, uh, I've been teasing lately, but I'm going to be starting a class series called How to Sculpt Like an Animator. Uh, where I really want to teach fundamentals of sculpting, but also how to, how to take a two-dimensional sketch that I'm going to do some real basic lessons in drawing and turn that into a three-dimensional piece of art in glass. But also make your glass look like it actually has movement to it and animation and not just like a static, stiff-looking piece of work. If you have basic fundamentals in glass, that's all you need. Um, I'm going to be offering some really basic beginner classes, but this course specifically is more of an intermediate to advanced class. But I find that uh, a lot of artists out there right now in the pipe industry are hungry for learning how to sculpt. Uh, sculpting solid work as well. And I teach and preach on here all the time uh, that it, your best bet to be successful as a glass blower is to not be a one-trick pony and to actually understand the material that way you can create whatever the hell it is you want to create. So, yeah, there you go. And I really hope you enjoy this episode with Ginger Ames. If you have any questions for her or would like to jump on her free calls on Thursdays, you can sign up at whisperfinancial.sh. I will have the link in the show notes for you. I definitely recommend taking full advantage of the free stuff she is offering. And if you have any questions, again, reach out to her. Hope to see you guys in Las Vegas. Love you so much. Thanks for tuning in and staying in touch with me as I have been super busy behind the scenes and we officially have uh, another episode out. So here we go. Episode number 28 and we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Hey, Ginger. Welcome to the show. Hey, how's it going? Oh, it's going great. So glad to have you on. We've... Uh, Definitely had some appointments scheduled in the past, and I, I had things happening and all kind of shit. That, you know, I can come up with any excuse, but I'm just mm -hmm. gonna say we're in the middle of a pandemic, so everything is, uh, you know, okay. I guess if we don't make appointments when we're supposed to. <laughs> Yeah, you know? <laughs> right yeah the whole omicron thing jesus Christ. you know every time i hear omicron i can't help but think of futurama and like the one omicron percy i ate <laughs> yep that's we we were like, all on the same time. page yeah absolutely at first i was like oh is this like some new transformer coming in to like take over the earth but uh yeah then the, then the futurama <laughs> reference came up and i was like oh yes uh, that's perfect yep yeah absolutely yep every time yeah, so to keep it's us on... It's all good, though. It was the holidays, you know? We all yeah. get busy. Lots happen. So, yeah, I'm just glad we're getting together finally. Yeah, and it's 2022. Can you believe that? <laughs> good God. Fuck, man. Jesus. Yeah. When it... did this all start? It's, like, been a blur. <laughs> I know. <laughs> the last couple of years has just been, like, an utter blur. Yeah. Oh, my God. I know. It's insane. End of 2019 yeah. is when this all began. So... Dang. Damn. Yeah. But okay. That, yeah, but well, that being said, are. yeah, we survived. yeah, yeah, and it's been since uh, July since I recorded since uh, I had salt on last, so I'm excited to get uh, get this rolling again. Oh. And uh, 2022, my real focus is going back to like we talked pre-show is really focusing on business and uh, the mindset mm -hmm. because I, I know a lot of artists right now are finding a lot more success than they have in the past, and now they have more money and they need to know what to do with that money besides just buying bags mm -hmm. of weed. And uh, you know whatever buying else. bags of weed or just like all the little toys, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So lifestyle creep is what that's called. <laughs> yeah. I can see that. That makes total <laughs> sense. So we're gonna eventually get there, mm -hmm. but before we do, uh, I'd like to get you started by giving us your mm -hmm. superhero origin story and uh, how you were introduced to glass in general. Uh, well, there are a few points where glass made its presence known in my life. Um, the first time was when I was like nine years old, and we were going camping all up and down the Oregon coast. And we were hanging out in this one town, I think it was Bandon, Bandon by the Sea, and just like checking out the shops. And one of the shops just had one of the like traditional 
glass blowers with the glory hole and everything just like behind this huge glass and like this window and you can watch him working and he was just blasting jazz his hair was just like blown black back and he just looked so cool <laughs> and like so in it i was just like blown away when i was yeah but, like just a little kid like i can't believe mm -hmm. somebody's doing this <laughs> um <laughs> and then in high school um unfortunately my school did not have a glass blowing program but some of the local other schools did so i did stained glass instead and that was like my high school thesis was like a tiffany reproduction lamp um huh. so Neat. i felt very strongly about the whole like crafting thing yeah yeah, that's pretty cool. We have we actually here in Orlando we have. Uh, oh, sorry, a, you. Uh, signal being weird. Mm -hmm. Oh, and that being said, just on a side note, if, yeah, if a little bit, if by chance like we get cut off or whatever, I think the link will just bring us right back into the same meeting page. I think that's how Zoom works. Cool, works for me. Okay, cool. But, but yeah, um, but yeah, yeah the thing is though, like, you, you dude, like my like I I got an Asian mom. And she's like, you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer, right? Like that, that was just drilled into my head since I was a kid. And I never, I mean, I always assumed that I would go to college and then beyond that, continue my schooling. That was just like a given. That was going to be my life trajectory. Um, even so, like I have the strong creative side and it comes from both sides of my family. So I don't know what the hell they were talking about. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it comes from both sides of my family and like in college, in college, I became a little bit of a party girl. Um, and uh, all right, statute of limitations, we're all good here. Um, that was a long time ago. I'm old as shit now, in my eyes. Um, probably younger than you, sorry, but still. Well, I'm 45, so. Um, yeah, I was friends with a lot of Okay, so you're old as shit. All right, there we mm -hmm. go. <laughs> yep. Um, I had a lot of friends who were chemists, and um, they wanted to do some fun stuff but they didn't have the glassware. And I was like, well, maybe I can make it. I don't know where that idea popped into my head that I could do the glassware part, you know, but like, yeah, I was like, all right, let me see what I can do. So I tried to get apprenticeships at like all these different like scientific uh, shops, even like the, the university glass blower. That was a cool old dude going into his shop and watching him fuck around with stuff. Um, eventually though, I couldn't find a spot and down, <laughs> This is in the early 2000s, okay? So I went on eBay and I found a few VHS tapes, Secrets to Making Glass Pipes, part one and two. I think there's a copy of these in the Corning Museum. Interesting. <laughs> like I tried I tried to find them again and they're like, yeah, no, they're, they're, they're kept in the archives of the Corning Glass Museum. Um, and uh, yeah. I eventually found a person who was teaching how to make glass pipes down in Santa Cruz, took the class and then just kind of set up my own shit from there. It was on like a, a major minor, not even a red max. It was just the, the major minor Heck yeah. just set up on a folding table in the backyard of my co-op. And like, I couldn't see the damn flame because of the sun. So the wind would blow and it'd be like, ah, oh, shit, it's burning me. But I <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. Isn't it crazy when you're blowing glass in the sun like that? It's like you're blowing glass blind. It's it's incredible. Dude, right? And I made turds. I made just all sorts of like fucked up little shit, right? And just throwing them in the bucket of vermiculite and seeing what comes out and doesn't crack, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, super old school. But uh, I passed around a lot of different pipes around that co-op. and We never did anything like scientific wise. That <laughs> that That never happened. Oh well. It's interesting oh, well. though having that, no, that spark and that the spark in the thought and then all of a sudden, you know, you took action, which is yeah. what's important. Man, that's just like story of my life. I just I just do things. And that's what that's kind of what happened with Glass becoming professional at it. Like I didn't take it seriously. It was just my hobby for like several years. And then like in two thousand and eight I had like a mid twenties life crisis because, you know, we do these kinds of things. Right? Yeah, you're a quarter century old. And, and like, I went oh, to God. burning that. I'm a quarter century. Oh my God. What am I going to do? Yeah. Um, as if, as if there's not so much more going on, like that you'll go through in your life. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was, I went to Burning Man for the first time for the honeymoon and I was just super inspired. And then I discovered an apprenticeship with the notorious Revere glass when I got back and yeah, went full time after that and just kind of took off. Interesting. Hell yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Dustin's a great so, teacher. Sorry for the long story, but yeah, that's that's the whole that's the whole thing. Oh no, it's all good. How long did you work with Dustin? God, not, I don't think much more than like five months, actually. Yeah. Like, at the end of five months, he brought in oh, what's the go- dude's name? His handle was Mad Mad City from Toke City. He came in to the shop sometime, and he had he ran the the magazine Glass Aficionado. Okay. And he saw one of the Shirley's that I had made. And I guess he was like a big Shirley's fan. And uh, um, we were doing line work, you know, just big wags. And uh, he really liked it. And he's like, what do you want for it? And I was just like, put it in the magazine. <laughs> put it in the magazine, dude. That's payment. That's all you got to do. And then it was just, I just took off from there. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's funny, man. You just never know like who you're going to run into or what course that's going to take you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Yush came to the shop a few times and he was just so fantastic. Such a sweetie. And we got to learn from him a little bit um, here and there, like to tighten up like what we had learned from uh, Dustin and and Dave, but Dave Strobel. So, yeah, that was that was a good time. That was a really cool time. I left and then it uh, I think a few months after that, it all kind of fell apart. The whole apprenticeship thing they had going on. But glad I caught the wave yeah for sure was that after operation pipe dreams i'm I'm thinking oh yeah right time wise oh yeah that was way after Uh uh-huh yeah way after god operation pipe dreams of course i start to get into things after like they're like persecuted but that's just story of my life yeah get into whatever other people walk away from (laughs) pick up the pieces and put them all (laughs) back together and start it all over again Ah, uh, I know, right? Right. Yeah, that's what a lot uh, of us had to do. That was a really fun time back in Revere. I'm just thinking about that. That's when, that's where Punny and I met, because um, he started up the apprenticeship there too, and then, oh gosh, there are a couple other folks that came out of that, and then for for a brief hot minute, when after I set up my own shop, um, like uh, Phil Siegel pulled through a little bit, and yeah. It's hard to remember all the names, to be honest. Oh, I know. There's so but... many. I know. I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's interesting too. Mm-hmm. The way Dustin did that with the and then started his YouTube stuff and it, you know Degeneration Art inspired a whole generation of glassblowers, but also Dustin Revere did too. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's like this generation that I consider to be like the Revere glassblowers, like his his right? understudies that he doesn't even yeah. know exist necessarily, but they just caught on to us watching his videos on YouTube. Mm, mm, that's true. That's super true. That's so crazy to me that you can learn glass blowing just like turning on a YouTube or something now because it was just so fucking hard to find anybody to teach you back in the day. It was just like yeah. closed doors, like it's who you knew and who knew who would be able to get you in to learn something, maybe if they were being honest about how they were teaching you. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was definitely so not closeted back. Oh, <laughs> yeah, big time. Like I have, I'm, I'll never forget walking into this guy's studio and he was getting ready to go on break anyways, but he. Like I walked in there and I started talking glass and stuff, and he's like, "You glass blower?" I'm like, "Yeah," and he covered his bench with a big sheet, <laughs> so I couldn't even see his setup or anything. And he's like, "Yeah, I'm going on break." Oh, nice to meet you. Oh, yeah. no, yeah, access denied. <laughs> or if they were, you know, a saw like a hot shop furnace worker, they were like, "Oh, so you're you make pipes?" And at the time, I wasn't. I was making pennants and stuff, working the Renaissance Festival circuit, you know. But uh, my goal was yeah, pipes cool. eventually. But, you know, it's just funny mm-hmm. how how the mm-hmm. times were back then compared to where now. Like, the hot shop guys are like, oh, we want to get on that torch. We're jealous. You know, it's... Uh, oh, are they now? It's funny. That's yeah, it's, funny. it's interesting. It's a back and forth kind of thing, it seems like. Well, you know, I think the part of it is, is that, like, glass blowers, like, we really enjoy our craft and they're fascinated by it. And there's just so much to learn within the art of glass that, like... If you have any amount of create like curiosity in your life to be exposed to another technique is just like it's kind of like a hunger almost to like try that out as well. Mm-hmm. So especially as the pipe movement gets more um, uh, legitimacy, more and more people are like, you know, maybe I will check it out. <laughs> yeah, especially now with like the classes that are being taught at Corning, you know, for pipe making, it's crazy. Mm. Oh, badass. Yeah, it's Super amazing. Badass. Yeah, it's amazing. So from that point, you so you got through your glass and then uh, eventually adopted a cat that then uh, <laughs> became a, a huge transition for you in life, I guess is what it's what it seems like. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we got the cat. I don't, 
did I blow glass before that? Yes, I was blowing glass before we got the cat. Um, and it was, it was still a hobby for me. Um, until, yeah, until Revere. So he was with me while it was still a hobby, still setting up like a folding table in the backyard. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I was just the craziest cat lady, man. So like I would make all sorts of like cat stuff. And eventually the gravy boat came out of that. It, it was never meant to be what it became. It was just going to be a joke. Like somebody had a post about like a gravy boat shaped like a squirrel that was puking. And I was like, well, obviously that's wrong because like when you think of a puking animal, you think of the damn cat puking in your shoes, puking on your computer, whatever. That's what they do, yep. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, made a puking cat. And then like, my goodness, that just like took off. That was crazy. That was, yeah. That was a good transition in my life, I gotta say, because that was that was a time when I had to step away from glass. Just like, I don't know, something about the scene burnt me out. It was crazy, and I had to step away. That's why I like left from like, what was that, 2013 till just this last year? Huh. Wow. I was out. I I cut it off completely. Like clean break. Don't even want to look at anything. Don't want to hear about it. Just got to just got to do something else with my life. I don't know. That was just a weird period in my life, man. And getting so involved in the scene as I was, I don't know. I don't think I was approaching it in a healthy way and, and ended up burning out, but that's where the puking cat came through and was able to help me like financially make that transition away from glass blowing to figuring out what the fuck I was going to do with myself. Yeah. 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 It's interesting you say that too, about getting burnout. Cause that was, the, that was my time period where I began to get burnout. Cause I had just started working at Disney and I was yeah. also trying to like balance my side hustle with my glass pipes and stuff. I had a wholesaler I was still selling to. So I would get up at 5am, mm. turn my kiln mm. on, get my shit ready for work. And then I would work for like two hours on the torch and then get in my car, drive an hour and a half to work, work a full eight hour shift, drive mm. an hour and a half home. And on the way home, call my ex-wife at, my wife at the time, like, hey, can you turn the kiln on for me? And then she turned it on. I get home and mm. work a couple more hours. And I did that for like six months. And it got to a point where I was like falling asleep on the way home driving and not remembering my drives, you Dude. know. And so I was like, all right, no. I got to take a break. And then I... So I took you a break from Disney. Got to dial that back. Yeah, totally. So oh, from it, Disney. Yeah, so I decided because mm -hmm. the glass was still in demand, you know, and I knew the numbers were there. So I opened up my own little studio sure. space and started renting out the space. And then my entire life went to shit mm -hmm. because I was just juggling too much. But also at the same time, mm -hmm. even though I was seasonal, quote unquote, over at the Mouse House, I was still having to cover one of our artists uh, who was making this castle for the museum in Shanghai. And... Uh, they have they were celebrating like their mm. 50th anniversary for this this a large glass museum in Shanghai, and uh, he made this the mm -hmm. biggest glass castle ever made doing the stitch work and it's an amazing piece. But holy shit! Yeah, it took him five months to make this thing. So I was covering him for five months. So I was working full time there, working full time at my studio, trying to balance everything out. And we just closed the doors and went through a divorce and moved to Orlando. <laughs> So it's like, oh shit! Yeah, literally, it all went yeah, to shit. Yeah, that's some big life transitions. Yeah, yeah. And then I took two years that's off rough, making man. pipes. Yeah, it, it was crazy. I took off two years making pipes, like just completely to reset my brain from like I don't need to do production stuff mm -hmm. anymore. You know, like everything. Also, heal my heart because I, you yeah. know, when you're away from a situation, you don't realize how things were when you're in it compared to when you're outside of it. You know. Yeah. So it gave me that. Yeah, that... it's like driving through a fog bank, man. You can see the outside of it and the other side of it. But when you're in it, you're in it. Then yeah. it never ends. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I was able to get that clarity and then really find directions in life and where do I want to go and blah, blah, blah. So here we are. So mm -hmm. the same time that I was watching the industry grow and get crazy and people were selling pieces for hundreds of thousands of dollars where I'm sitting here at, you know, entertaining guests at, at the Magic Kingdom or whatever. And I'm like, damn, I would love that kind of money because I'd know I could make that kind of stuff, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. But I just kept my blinders on and, and watched it from afar st while still doing this podcast and trying to help those that were finding that success continue to find the success and mm. then inspire others to also find that. So it's a... so you didn't cut yourself off completely. You did the podcast and you were still kind of watching things to see how things were coming along. Yeah. Like standing outside the culture still a little bit yeah exactly and, and and tapped into the tapped into it but really coming from a perspective as an artist not really necessarily as a pipe maker you know mm -hmm. just because of how mm -hmm. how the glass scene so is kind of feeding your creativity more 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I found like the podcast was a good outlet for that. But also because I'm in Florida, it's hard for me to oh. get out of here to go to shows and and and, and intermingle with people. So oh, this yeah. is my way to introduce myself to the world and also get to talk to artists at the same time while not being burnt out from blowing glass 80 hours a week, you know. Well, I see something super important in what you're doing here, dude. You're just kind of like recording this movement and the culture of it and there isn't any other like voice recording or discussion about it really other than like the other podcasts that are like out there there's just like some magazines and then just like i don't know maybe just some videos or something mm -hmm. like that but this is a it's, you've been doing this for so long it's just a fantastic like snapshot of Wow, how the culture is coming along in all these little interviews that you're doing. It's really admirable work. Dude. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. And that's, and that's been the main driving force for me. That's just, just being like a, cause like from, so for my family, just on a whole side note, my grandfather was like our genealogy person before the, the internet was a mm -hmm. big thing. He used to go to Europe every year and like do research and like just, we, we've gone back several, several generations now we know of, you know, from our family's existence. You know, like my, my last name mm -hmm. I know means Woodcastle. The last name is Borgholzer, but like the it's a French German mix, but it means Woodcastle. And I guess my family built castles in France back in the day, before they came oh, to, cool. to came to the States. Yeah, it's it's, right. it's wild. So, but I once he passed away, I became the family historian, and I've always enjoyed doing research mm -hmm. and stuff. So it was just kind of natural for me to just kind of go on my little path to fulfill this. that role for the glass pipe yeah, movement. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, it's been tough, but I've been uh, keeping mm -hmm. keeping it going. And, uh, you know, like I said, this year is really business is the big talk because I think really people really need to wake the fuck mm -hmm. up and understand that even if they're 20 years old or 25 doing this, they're going to get old and they're going to need retirement and have to pay for bills and not live off the government Social Security that probably won't exist in 50 years from now. Mm -hmm. You know, Dude, seriously, like, yeah, I feel like when I was really getting involved with scene back in the day, like. I feel that it was almost, it reminded me almost of like a college scene where everybody was just having fun and just like fucking off and not really like thinking too hard about what their future was, was going to look like. Um, and now coming back into it at like the tail end of 2021, you, I see all these people, you know, have grown up and matured and they're like, wow, this shit matters. I kind of want stability in my life now. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's ha getting married and having kids. And they're like, okay, I guess I do have to work a nine to five, but it's on my own time. You know, so it's a different like, mentality. How the fuck do I get a mortgage for a house? You know, like that kind of bullshit. Yeah, yeah, course, totally. We're all wondering that really, even with like stable jobs and all. So. Yeah. Well, you know, like, like even goodness. during, like during the downtime when we were all locked down and the government was handing out money, like if you didn't have proof of income as, as a pay that you were paying federal taxes, yeah. you weren't getting any money. So a lot of artists out there had to like sell all their shit to fucking eat, you know? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. It's, it's, just, totally. it's so important. Totally. Like I've had a, a basic, uh, I guess my own fictitious name and this, you know, sole proprietorship stuff as my business has, mm -hmm. you know, over the years, but I'm this year, I'm officially getting my, like next, actually the end of this week, we're filing my LLC. For the first time in 20 years. Hey, congratulations, man. That's a big step. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited about it. And my brother, who is like half my age, I was 16 when he was born. He's been in the glass industry for mm. nine years now. And he's taken this completely serious from day one, as including having an LLC and paying himself a paycheck. And he has an assistant that he pays a paycheck. And this person is paying taxes and he's paying his taxes. And it's, you know, I said a lot him to take out, mm -hmm. take out business loans mm -hmm. and and really grow to a point to where he's found more success in the pipe industry than I found in the last 20 years. He's found it in the last eight, you know, so mm. it's interesting, mm. but I've also Dude, different see, you generations. You start out early being organized and then like that really translates well later on in your life. But like, it just builds on itself once you have yourself organized like that. Yeah, completely. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. So that's why, you know, you know, I had, you had reached out to me uh, about this and that's why, you know, why right. we're here to really talk about helping, helping folks uh, get their shit together as I consider like the financial house of things, you know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, no, I hear it. <laughs> but yeah. But before we go down that path, I definitely want to cover heaters because this last at the end of last year, uh, they had the heaters uh, pipe show mm -hmm. that was in Colorado, right? Um, yeah, right? Colorado. 
right? Just south of downtown Denver. Yeah, so you uh, you attended and uh, talked to some folks, and we definitely I'm interested in how the show went, uh, the artists that were there, and some of the insights that you received mm-hmm. while you are there. You know, the funny thing is, is, like, I had no idea that this show was, like, such a big deal when, like, I had just reconnected with Honey because I just happened to be in Denver, like, the month before. I was like, you know what? Let's see how that guy's doing. I remember he was, like, super chill, really nice, kind-hearted guy. Let's go ahead and say hello. It's been, like, forever. And he's like, oh, cool. So nice to see you and all that. Like, let's collab. I'm like, oh, that's nice of you. I haven't touched the torch in a while. I appreciate the thought. He's like, no, we're going to collab. Like, oh. Oh, okay, cool. All right. Um, sure. He's like, yeah, I got a show coming up. I'm like, cool. What's it called? Heaters. Return of the Heaters. Like, huh. All right. Well, I'll look that up, see what that's about. <laughs> it's just like, oh, okay. It's just like this huge goddamn event um, with like all these big ass names. Um, yeah. I'm super intimidating after I found out what it was all about. But yeah, I imagine so. It was cool. Yeah, it was really nice to like see a lot of the old folks that I hadn't seen in a long time. I came up the week before Heaters to finish up the collab with Honey and had a lot of time on my hands. So we got to hang out like downstairs in his shop and upstairs at Everdream a little bit. Um, it was a madhouse getting ready for the show. Like, you know how, like, before any show, like, you're, you got your nose to the grindstone, you're burning the midnight oil, you're trying to crank it out. And it was like that for the build up to the show, the the studio upstairs, Everdream, just like more and more people just started arriving and coming in to where it was just like crowded. Like I, I didn't want to be up there too much because I knew that like there was so many people that it would actually maybe get into like the elbow space of the artists while they were working. Wow. <laughs> right yeah and then like ubatuba had his show the night before um and a ton of people showed up for that as well um it it was incredible actually just to see just how many people were there yeah like a ton of collectors showed up beforehand um and as well as just like other glass artists and uh, people who appreciate this kind of work um and that I think that was indicative of the actual turnout for the show itself because that line to get in the doors it wrapped around the block and stayed that way for like four hours unreal (laughs) dude seriously and inside it was just like packed to capacity and i was like we got to get more mass out right (laughs) like this this pandemic's not over yet, guys. We got it. We got to all wear these masks. So not everybody like felt that way, it seems. But uh, but it was incredible. The turnout was fantastic. Just like so many people coming through, and the work itself was just like spot on. It was, oh yeah. The 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 coup de gras though was of course the um uh, the king of kings right i'm sure you've seen the pictures of that one by uh buck and adam g their collab uh i honestly don't think i have i gotta look this up right now yeah i, I don't think oh, i did yeah look that up because that was beyond impressive that was just like what the fuck <laughs> did you guys just do like this is your like your your like your masterpiece and i guess they've been working on it for three years back and forth um, wow. but it was like this two foot, three foot, I don't remember tall and, and so wide bust of a, a lion with a crown and the full mane. Oh yeah. I'm seeing it. And now. Re- Dude, articulating glass hoses coming out of it. <laughs> wow. The fuck dude. Yeah. That was on like this, like like slowly rotating pedestal it was it was pretty impressive really really impressive people people brought their a game of those guys just like it just went for that extra credit that's for sure <laughs> yeah it's incredible like it's so much fun to see the level of what's glasses being pushed to become and 
20 years ago, I mean, none of us imagined any of it. And then I started seeing like the Scott Deppies of the world coming out there and like, where the fuck did this guy come from? And what, how, how is he doing what he's doing with this color that he's doing? Which is why I'm stoked for this, this mm. Las Vegas show to be able to like talk to him and ask him these questions. Cause I know a lot of people are really mm. curious about mm -hmm. it, but really seeing like just the, the evolution of where this industry has gone to museum quality work that's yeah. being put in places like Corning, you know, it's just, it's phenomenal. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah this is it's, crazy yeah it's it's that's fantastic and like pretty much as far as i can tell uh, pretty much everybody sold out at the show um uh, i'm not surprised at the because of the quality of the work that was there um the only the only gripe that i would have to be honest about the show is like the lack of representation of the, like the female artists that yeah. are out there because there are some like pretty fantastic ones mm -hmm. um why weren't they there i don't know I think I was like the only one who had any sort of presence doing a collab with Plenty, huh. um, with with my like janky ass haven't done them in seven years wigwags that he threw on this beautiful piece. Hell yeah! <laughs> I can't believe he used it. Oh, what a sweetheart! <laughs> Did it sell? Oh yeah, he actually um, decided to raffle it off, um, and despite the fact that he did some freaking amazing work and in multiple spots like two different spots um uh, where he did his work on the stem and actually the can of the piece uh and, and raffled the fucking thing off i can't believe it and, and that dude was like hella stoked the winner of that one was just like oh i can't believe i got this heck yeah um, that's fun yeah I, I appreciate i appreciate where where his heart was coming from with that and that that's super cool super cool one of the things, though, like I found really remarkable um, regarding the show was, and all the artists there, is like all of the wives and girlfriends and sisters, like all those ladies were the logistics. They took care of everything. They, like this show would not have happened without all of those ladies like pulling all this shit together. Uh, I, I'm impressed. I'm just absolutely impressed by like, like the amount of work that went into all of that. Yeah. Yeah, I can't imagine. Not to mention, I ended like, up talking to a lot of those. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that's awesome. Yeah, because I, I, you know, I get concerned when I see these shows because they have these little, you know, cases in the middle of the rooms all spread out, and you get all these people, and I'm like, mm -hmm. someone's gonna turn around the wrong way, or some. You see, you know, guys with backpacks on and stuff. I'm like, oh know, god, you know, I know, you know, right? you know what I mean? like. <laughs> yeah it's uh like they're pokemon trainers or something but uh yeah I, mm -hmm. it's uh it's definitely interesting so like you're saying like seeing the logistics of how things are come together to make it a successful show but also mm -hmm. safe you know in these times it's uh it's, it's pretty rad and mm -hmm. definitely takes the the ladies that are supporting these guys to uh allow the guys not only to become the artists that they are but also to be able to then put on these kind of shows dude yeah and just like all the kind of work that that goes into the preparation getting things together um getting the artwork transported in and out and and just like the full-on organization of everything and all those logistics like the event management like holy shit um like the, these ladies are making all this happen they're they're the powerhouse behind all of this art really yeah, that's awesome um yeah yeah super cool super cool um yeah i don't you know I, it's interesting because like you know you would think with covid times that people like there might not have been too good of a turnout especially because like denver got like it's it's first snow of the season like the day before so it was like balls cold out holy shit it was cold out there <laughs> oh my god <laughs> yeah i bet you would understand like being somebody from florida i from california coming out there was just like why mm -hmm. why are you like this out here <laughs> yeah <laughs> but people still made it i think there's just like this real craving um to get out and then to see all this work and to see like how the a game was bringing it to the table and it yeah super successful show super super i think it went like a, like an hour or so longer than expected just because there was still just like so many people like coming in and hmm. all Oh. yeah it's good to see because mm -hmm. i know like las vegas last year like they were like everybody said it was like that i talked to you sold out i know there's some artists i did not but i know pretty much everybody i talked to sold out and it seems like everybody's just hungry to get out and socialize and mm -hmm. you know it's you know we're in this 
pandemic, you know, fatigue in a sense, you know, with everything, mm-hmm. you know, cause like I wear my mask everywhere I go, but I'm still like, Oh God, I'm going to fucking put this thing back on my face, you know, kind of thing. I'm just so over it, but Hey, not everybody's on the mm-hmm. same page as you and I are with, uh, you know, doing what you got to do to keep us all safe and get past this bullshit, unfortunately, but you know, it is what it is. Politics yeah. aside. Yeah. Yeah, so, indeed, indeed. Yeah, it's awesome to hear. So Just need to get past it. So as you're there, seeing all these pieces selling, and you know, for thousands and thousands of dollars, are you in the back of your brain thinking like, "All right, so what are these guys doing with all this money? <laughs> are they gonna be Are they gonna be smart, <laughs> yeah, right? smart with it?" <laughs> um, I don't want to like offend anybody, right? But it's just like. What the fuck are you guys doing with this money? Like, holy shit. That is like the refrain that I heard from all these ladies too, talking to them. And like when I was describing the kind of stuff that I do and they were like, oh my God, these guys need that kind of help. Like they, they really need to talk to somebody about, about like constantly just like spending all the cash they have. <laughs> like just buying toy after toy after toy. It's just like, okay, well, it's great that you can afford this, but what are you doing for future you? Mm-hmm. Like, with like a couple years down the line, and you're just like, where did all that money go? Like, hopefully into an account somewhere making money for you. Um, that's what we're all hoping for. Yeah, I was definitely wondering what the hell was going on. I know a lot of them are involved in like this real estate um, thing down in Costa Rica. So I think a lot of them were like paying in toward that and paying off their debts in that regard. Um, but yeah, I was definitely wondering like, okay, now what are you going to go out and buy a car or, you know, another, another car? Yeah. Another Tesla or (laughs) whatever. Your fleet. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you know, like I've been doing this for 22 years now almost. And like, I've been dealing with hand pain for probably about six to eight months now. I just had like just some weird stuff going on in the base of my, of my wrist. And Mm. I've, I've seen an orthopedic Mm. surgeon, had things checked out. I had a weird cyst grow on my wrist when I was like in my early 20s and it went away but I yeah. guess like the, I still have like some deposit debris that's in that area that I may have to have surgery one oh. day to have it removed like it's just sitting here right now it's been oh, bothering shit. me and it's just from overworking it and you know blah 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 so I wear a brace when I sleep mm-hmm. at night now and it's just annoying but like mm-hmm. for myself mm-hmm. it, you know it wasn't a wake-up call but it kind of was like hey you know this is something that is mm-hmm. you know potentially could have me not work glass anymore because of my thing, you know, I can't use my hand for certain things and dealing with carpal tunnel, right. you know, all kind of stuff that's potentially going to happen to people. And, uh, so yeah. uh, again, why I yeah. want to talk about this, cause it's so important to, you know, not only to have the insurance and things like that for yourself, but also to then think about 60 years down the road, you know, like we, you know, mm-hmm. so what kind of, adv- yeah. as, as a financial advisor on your end, you know, focusing on mm. artists in a sense, and the creatives, like, you know, advice, you know, getting started, you know, you get your first big sale, you sell like a thousand dollar sale, which for some folks is a small, mm-hmm. a small sale. But for some of us out there, it's a big sale. So, you know, so you get your first thousand right. dollar sale. So then uh, then what do you do? Well, that would be the category of a windfall. What happens when you get a windfall? Mm. And there's a lot of different ways you can approach with the windfall, I mean, at the very least, if what you want to do is to start saving for your retirement is you want to save like 10% of all income that comes in. And after 25 years of that, like you'll be set for retirement, like just by the law of compounding, basically. Mm -hmm. So if you set aside that hundred bucks out of your thousand dollars, then you got $900 left to to mess around with. It depends what it is from there. Do you have like crippling credit card debt you got to deal with at like a 30 percent interest rate holy shit pay that thing off (laughs) like as as best as you can um do you have an emergency fund set aside for like when you break your arm and you can't work for a couple months um you want to have like at least three months of like money set aside like three months expenses to cover your ass Mm -hmm. so there's your emergency fund right there so depending on how that and the and the debt, how that is all played out from there. Like if you're running your own business, you could set up your own retirement account and then like actually be able to save some money and have it grow tax free. So that would be either like the easiest thing would be just a plain old IRA, uh, 
like a investment retirement account or individual retirement account um, or a solo 401k if you want to go that far. But the, the easy, the easy low hanging fruit would be an IRA to throw that money into. And then of course, have some fun, you know, mm -hmm. of course. <laughs> you can't all just be like stoic and be like, I'm going to sock everything away. You can't be like, like total ant versus grasshopper. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, so have some fun. Just don't have fun with all of it. Just, just set some aside and there, there you go. Get, get some, go treat yourself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> Today is treat yourself day. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> so and with like the Roths and stuff, like you can pretty much walk into most banks and set those type of things up. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. You can set it up with a bank. Um, I would, I would probably set it up more with like a, um, uh, investment company. So like the three big names are going to be, um, Schwab, Fidelity and Vanguard, and they all have their pros and cons. And, you can just do that online. Same as how you open a bank account online. Just go in, fill out the information, and they'll get set you up with an account. There you go. And now, and as far as like IRA, throw some money in. Because I, I know with the IRAs and stuff, like a lot of there's different advice. For myself, I have a Roth because mm -hmm. I'm paying my taxes now. So when I pull the money out of retirement, oh, there's no taxes because it can be a lot if you, you know yeah. at the end. So I I, I would yeah. assume you'd probably recommend the same type of thing doing a Roth IRA because like my 401k is through works the same way. It depends, actually, uh, on what exactly it is that you intend to do with your retirement money. Okay. Um, for instance, the the Roth IRA, like that, is a super crazy powerful tool for generational wealth. So if you want to help get your kids set up, um, they can inherit that Roth IRA, and you never have to take out a something called a retire a minimum RMD um, required minimum distribution. Those start at age seventy two, or 72 now oh, they changed it with one of the last tax like acts that went through but i think it's 72 um but with a roth ira you never have to take that out you can just let that keep growing and pass it on to your kids so if that's what you want to do great or the other conventional wisdom is that if you want to do a traditional ira what the the way to approach that tax wise is if you are in a high tax bracket now but you plan to be in a low one later when you retire a traditional IRA would be better because you get better savings on your taxes. Um, so it's a lot of different things. I, I love Roth IRAs. There's just like so much that you can do with them. And the fact that you can just like grow your money like crazy, mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, and then of course you gotta go into like what kind of investments you're putting in there and how to do that in the most tax advantaged way. Um, that gets a little bit into portfolio construction there and, and fun little strategies in that regard. But to, for the most part, I think I would say that like a Roth IRA would suit most people really well. Yeah. For, for the most part. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing is like, if, if we're talking about people making, you know, $250,000 on a piece that's sold, um, you are above the limit for both an IRA and a Roth IRA. Yeah, exactly. Like they got, right? That's where you tap into your 401k because you can make as much as you want and still put in that money in a 401k. Okay. Yeah, that's good advice because mm -hmm. it definitely is where, you know, the industry is at right now. There's There definitely are people that are making that kind of money, whether it's buy one piece or going to a trade show and making a quarter million dollars in sales in a day, you know, type of thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I, f I find too, like generationally wise, a lot of the gen newer generations are investing into, you know, digital currencies, bitcoins, and what have you. You know, I'm I don't. I actually just got my certificate in that. Oh, nice. <laughs> I haven't yet. I yeah. definitely want to, and I've you know kind of kicked myself for not at one point in time because I'm sure at some you know, cash will no longer be a thing down mm -hmm. down the road, and things will be going digital, <clears throat> as most you know mm -hmm. transactions mm -hmm. are these days. Um, mm -hmm. So you know mm -hmm. that is definitely a, one of those fluid ups and downs, roller coaster rides, like the stock market that, you know, you just got to, got to ride and see if it works for you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. It does have like a fairly high volatility depending on like how you invest in cryptocurrencies. Like if you do direct coin holdings versus like investing in one of those like trusts, like the like grayscale, um, there's different kinds of things that you can actually buy through your investment company that are already like vetted by the, um, um, SEC and FINRA and all that. Um, those, uh, 
those are like the grayscale Bitcoin trust, grayscale such and such trust, and so on. There's a couple others in the game that just came through. Um, those are way less volatile than actual direct coin holdings. Um, and they're a little step away from that. There's pros and cons, but that that is one other option out there for exposure to digital assets. Interesting. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there are different ways to get exposed to digital assets if that's something that you want to add into your portfolio. And like, to be honest, the one thing that like gets the financial advisors super interested in digital assets is the fact that it is like non-correlated. Um, and I'll explain this later. It is non-correlated with any other asset class, which means when stocks go up, Bitcoin does its own thing. When bonds go up or down, Bitcoin does its own thing international this still does its own thing and when you are able to put together different asset classes that don't move in lockstep you end up having a really good reward for the amount of risk you're taking on and that's called the efficient frontier to actually maximize the amount of reward you get for any given amount of risk that you take so financial advisors are super stoked about um the some financial advisors are super stoked about digital assets because they have this non-correlation that can really boost potentially the reward for the amount of risk taken on. Oh, interesting. So, yeah. 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 Um, I think um, I think a lot of people, though, are fairly well, to be honest, a lot of people are really well served with just like a target date investment you know like one of those like i'm gonna retire when 2060 or whatever the hell it is and just like leave it there and leave it the fuck alone yeah. <laughs> exactly that's that's what you want to do you want to set up your investments and leave it the fuck alone yeah yeah just to <laughs> pretend it doesn't exist and just because like you know you have money coming out of your account or whatever you know it, on a regular basis those mm -hmm. automatic payments that you're making you just forget about it it's like people yeah. that pay their, their ten dollars a month for netflix you just forget you're paying that every month you know kind of thing mm -hmm. so just set it and, forget and you adjust it. to that your lifestyle adjusts to whatever you set it at you know a lot of people like to call it pay yourself first mm -hmm. all right you get that money pay yourself then pay your bills uh, yeah. then you will learn your lifestyle will right size to what you give it. And that's, yeah, I think that's the big problem with a lot of the artists that are just making like mad cash is like, you, you gotta, you gotta remember the days when you're eating ramen every day, trying to like, like sneak some sort of income, uh, uh to pay rent that month. Uh, you got to remember what it's like and to, and to hold on to some of it, mm -hmm. you know, not so much that it, it fucks up your mental health, but like to hold on to some of it that, that money socked away. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I've listened to a lot of Dave Ramsey over the years, and he always talked about like the whole like having the college mindset, like pretend you're still in college. And, act, and for like the first couple of years of you making that income, act like you're still in college. And that way you can pay your debts off faster instead of going and buying that new car and the new house and the new mm -hmm. everything because... You know, and and, and and then you talk about backgrounds and a lot of artists in our industry not only have like, you know, mental health things going on that don't allow them to think mm. in a clear state of mind as far as like, you know, how do I do this? And oh, they get overwhelmed or the anxiety is there. And, mm -hmm. you know, like for myself, like, I've you know, mm -hmm. I, I've made a ton of money over the years, but I've, I was never really smart with it early on. It took a while to yeah. figure that out, you know? But, yeah, same here. You know. Like, my dad set me up with a Roth IRA when I was, like, in high school. And what the fuck did I do? I was like, oh, I can't pay rent this month. Let me just yank that money out and pay rent. Like, yeah. okay, that was a bad idea. The, the penalties, the taxes, all of that, and where I could have been now, today, if I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's amazing, <laughs> like, right? God damn it. Yeah. I mean, we're just not taught. We're not taught how to deal with money properly. And like, it becomes like this in the same way that glass blowing was like very closed door. I feel like finance was like very much a very closed door kind of thing. Like to the point, like back in the day, like what did you think of as a financial advisor? It was somebody who would pick stocks for you, right? Like your stock picker mm -hmm. or the person, the stock broker, somebody who would help you just like buy a mutual fund or some BS like that. Um, but nowadays, like there's so much out there where people are telling you, like, these are the ways that you can organize your personal finance. Um, 
we just need to get into the high school so that we can get in a little bit earlier for people rather than having to seek it out in their later years. Yeah. It's so much more simple too than like being lucky enough to pick the right stock. Like if you want to do better than like 90% of the like portfolio managers out there, you put your money in an index fund because that matches the market. 90% of like active managers out there are not going to beat the market and they're going to charge you a fee on top of that. You want to do better than them? Put it in an index fund. You'll be fine. <laughs> Slow and steady wins the race. That's mm-hmm. like that's the whole like Warren Buffett thing and and Jack Vogel thing, especially. Um, if if anybody wants to go down a fun little rabbit hole of of portfolio construction for the lazy and Ann, um, there's a, a really fun forum called Bogleheads, <laughs> and all these people talking about like oh don't don't pay for some advisor to tell you some bullshit just like do these things and you'll you'll be fine you'll be fine so for the diy person that's the place to go nice do you recommend like artists early on get their self set up as like a sole proprietorship type of thing just to just to have that basic business license under them or should they get into the llc so you can start doing like payroll and paying you know federal income taxes and social security and stuff like that I mean, an LLC, what it does is it really helps afford you um, a level of liability protection. Uh, so if what you want to do is to protect yourself that way, you're going to want to do the LLC for sure. Now, if you want to do, and, and this is where it gets a little bit weird because like there's LLC can be taxed as either a sole proprietorship or as an S corp. There are two different ways to go about doing an LLC. So you can have your sole proprietorship wrapped around an LLC, basically, or you could have an S corp wrapped in the LLC. So the S corp is the one where you end up like paying yourself a, a salary and a wage, and you got to file like a special business tax form and all this other kind of stuff. Um, that, for the most part, rule of thumb is going to matter once you hit about a hundred k in income. Um, that's that's when it starts to become beneficial. Um, until then, you might as well just do an LLC wrapped up um, around a sole proprietorship. Cool. I come at things from a tax perspective because like, <laughs> I'm a third generation tax professional. I've got like my enrolled agent card. My dad was a CPA. And he was a CPA before that. And all that BS. <laughs> nice. Yeah, the least taxes, the better. Because like I tell, tell people all the time, like, you know, even if you're not an LLC, you can still set yourself up and put money away for like quarterly taxes. So you have like these estimates and stuff for yourself. So you're not paying a $50,000 tax bill at the end of the year. Right. Know, doing, just, yeah. Exactly. That and whether or not your LLC is taxed as a sole proprietorship or if it's taxed as an S corp, you can still set up a solo 401k. You can totally do that either direction. And that's when you can really bang away those bucks uh, uh, because there's the employ so if it's s corp specifically there's the employee side of things where you can throw in like almost 20 grand um or more depending on what age you are but then there's also the profit sharing that your business will share with you and that can go up to fifty six thousand dollars like total mm-hmm. it combined with that other 20 uh, you, you put in there's a few caveats with that like you got to make a certain amount in order to qualify for that full amount but um you could really sock away some crazy money, uh, tax advantage if you go that route. Yeah, S corp style. And, I, and I'm glad you referred to like the entity because I've for years I've on the show I've just kind of tried to just pound in people's heads the fact that you're the artist, but what you're creating for the business is not you. The entity that you're selling for is what you, you work for your business. You know, so you need to pay yourself outside mm-hmm. your business. Your business needs to be its own thing that survives. And if you're just spending all your money, mm-hmm. you know, you don't have anything to uh, to call a business, which means that you're a hobby. You know? Right, exactly. And if you do that for too many numbers of years, well, then the IRS comes a knocking and is like, so all those deductions you took, you ain't get to get those anymore. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which yeah. I want to bring you on. And, and... I think there's... Oh, go on. Mm-hmm. Go on. Oh, well, there's just like a lot that, that people 
don't often cover when they think about their personal finances. Yes, there's your savings rate. Yes, there's how to pay down your debt. Um, yes, there's setting up your business structure and what you do with a windfall. Um, but then like what you were saying before, like, you fucked up your wrist a bit and you're going to have to do some surgery on it sometime in the future. There's a couple ways that, that somebody can approach um, mitigating that kind of situation. You can either like make sure that you have set aside a certain amount of money to cover the cost. Um, you can uh, also set up an emergency fund for if it gets so bad that you miss a couple months of work or this might be the harder one to do considering that this is a trade um that getting disability insurance it's hella expensive but like when you think about what your assets are in your life like what's what's worth a lot earning power is probably your biggest asset because that's what's going to keep the money coming in and where is your earning power as a glass blower it's in your hands mm -hmm. And you don't want to fuck up your hands. So what disability insurance does is it will cover your ass if you are so injured that you can no longer work. Yeah. Yeah, my work offered that and I didn't get it, but it's something I thought about, like, you know, like an Aflac, for instance, you know, like they're one of the companies out there that has that type of stuff that, you know, keeps your ass covered, like you're saying, mm -hmm. while you're while you're sitting on the couch recovering because you're out there skateboarding and you fucking try to do some tricks and broke your arm. You know. Right. Yeah, exactly. Like, yes, make your money. Yes, do these things right. But also protect it. Protect it from all the slings and arrows that life throws at you. Yeah. It's like why the uh, like opera singers and stuff, you know, like they insure their throats and all kind of crazy stuff, you know, for millions <laughs> of dollars. You know, it's just right. because that's, that's their thing. It's so important. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that's like a real eye opener and, and for myself as well, like thinking about it it's just like holy shit that's crazy like it could very well be that like the worth of all of your future ability to work is like in the millions mm -hmm. it could be that and that and that's an asset that you have yeah and it's all literally so in the palm of your hands <laughs> <laughs> yeah. literally <laughs> Uh, that's amazing. And I know this kind of, you know, for some people, this conversation, this type of talk is just kind of dry and mundane. I love this kind of stuff. I love talking business. I love talking, you know, finances and the ways to go about it. I, I'm not Dude, an expert at all. Here. I've listened to, you know, the Dave Ramsey's of the world's over the years and like learned certain you know things that I've been able to pass on. But yeah, so, but, mm -hmm. I, you know, having you on as a, as an actual professional advisor, I think is great. And that being said, you know, if anybody's confused about this kind of stuff mm -hmm. and, you, you know, you reached out to me because you're, mm -hmm you know, have a passion for the pipe community itself and want to help the artists out mm -hmm. there. So and if anybody has any questions, I definitely will uh, have your information in the show notes and then the links. And in the meantime, if you want to give us some, uh, some information on how people can contact you and uh, reach out to ask questions and maybe bring you on as an advisor. Hey, that sounds good to me, man. Like I actually plan to hold free office hours every Thursday. So anybody can bring whatever the hell question they want. Don't need to be intimidated. Um, like a lot of financial advisors, you got to pay money just to even talk to them. Like, fuck that. You got questions. I got answers. Come around on Thursdays. Just sign up. I'll limit it to four people so that everybody's question can actually get answered. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, feel free to come talk to me. Okay. What's, and, um, what's the website? Uh, the website is whisperfinancial.sh. Yeah, I'll make sure I have that in the show notes for everybody. Because, uh, yeah, yeah, might as well get this year started off the properly. Other half of, the other half of my business is going to be doing taxes as well. Okay. Um, I actually really enjoy doing taxes. I think it has something to do with the whole generational thing going on. <laughs> Your mind has to be a certain kind of warp to really enjoy taxes. But <laughs> Yeah, my wife does, does I guess too. it goes that way. Oh, there's one thing that I was thinking about, um, which I think is like one of the more important things when it comes to personal finance and it's not so much the finance side of that it's the personal side because you can learn whatever it is that you need to learn about money all that information is out there and has been out there there's dave ramsey there's all this other stuff right but like actually following through and putting this shit into action that's the hard part. 
mm-hmm. to get yourself to actually just straight up do it. And that's the part that like I really like to dive into. Like, I like call myself, and, and this is a whole new movement within the profession. Um, I call myself a financial life planner because it's money is so much more than money. It's it's about what you want to do with your life and what you find valuable. Mm-hmm. I agree completely. Yeah. Yeah. So the human side of money is where I think a lot of people just kind of gloss over. Whereas it's, it's actually just like probably the most important part of a financial education is learning about yourself and your relationship to money. Yeah, I agree. Cause I, I know for myself personally, like I grew up my a single mom on welfare and food stamps and so like, you know, she, for Christmas time, she would go to the local church and get toys. And so like if I had 20 bucks in my pocket, mm. I, you know, I'd go down the street and fucking blow it on whatever. Cause you know, I'd never had any kind of back background of how to take, mm. take care of my money, but also cause I had like this, you know, mindset that I wasn't really going to have it again. So I just might as well use it now, yeah. you know? And then I got older and was like yeah. the, the, the mentality of like, Oh, I could die tomorrow. So I might as well just have fun today, you know, bullshit. When the reality is, is that mm-hmm. more than likely I'm not going to die tomorrow and I'm probably going to live another 80 years. And, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, but it's hard to overcome that. Like our oh, money totally. attitudes, our beliefs, our perspectives, they're set by about age seven. Yeah. So yeah, I had what this... you were exposed to with your mom on welfare, living off of food stamps and such, like if that's what it was like for you before age seven, that stays with you the rest of your life. Yeah, that scarcity mindset really is what is, you know, something. Mm-hmm. And, and I didn't even know that was even a term or a thing until within probably about five or six years ago, you know, I came across it. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know what? That makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's why you would want, rather spend it rather than save it because you're more likely to be able to enjoy it now than later. Yeah. You know, like those kinds of like scripts that we that we say in our head that we that we say to ourselves regarding money. Yeah. So what was like, um, what would you say was your first money memory? Uh, so I've, I have been working literally since I was in kindergarten and my, the lady that used to babysit me was actually my kindergarten teacher. Like during the summertime, she was our summertime nanny basically. And, and her son, Dennis huh. taught me how to mow grass and he had a lot of lawn service and he would pay me a quarter for every lawn. I mean, I'm like six, seven years old, you know, pushing a lawnmower with him. And, uh, so, so early on I was like making, you know, a couple bucks a day mowing grass, you know, and it taught me work ethic Mm -hmm. on top of it, you know, so, which is why I still to this day, I work as hard as I do, not for quarters anymore, Mm -hmm. but you know, (laughs) (laughs) one would hope. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. But so that was like, Mm -hmm. like early on, like mindset was that, um, I know Mm -hmm. eventually when I got into being, you know, my actual job where I got a paycheck, I was 14 working at a nursing home just helping with the kitchen mm-hmm. kitchen stuff. And, you know, I was making some money. But again, if I made 500 bucks, I was like, oh, I can go buy this new stereo down the street or, you know, whatever it was, you know, because mm-hmm. I grew up with a lot of friends that, that were not only wealthy, but they had everything they ever wanted. Like, I didn't actually have my yeah. own game console until I was probably, like, in my 20s when I could actually afford to go buy one. Oh, holy shit. You know, kind of thing. Yeah. You know just because of the way my, my parents, mm-hmm. if they were going to spend the money, there was on something, it was on something other than that, you know, there wasn't a priority for me to sit around and play video games. Yeah. You know, so I'd go to my friends. Yeah, it was and, survival. And, right. So I, so I was influenced by my friends who had the money, who that spent the money all the time. And then mm-hmm. as I got into my 20s, it was the same way. Like friends that I had, I would see them making some sort of decent income. And then we'd go out and have these, you know, really nice dinners. And then, then, then eventually we got into our early 30s, and those same friends became very wealthy within real estate right before the 2008 bubble crashed. So my buddy had a boat, and we'd go out for dinner on his boat, you know, to these restaurants and be super swanky. And and and, and my mindset long term, that's what I want to be able to do. That I want to have that lifestyle. Like I like I like a posh lifestyle. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I'm mm-hmm. very simple. I could you know sleep in my car if I have to, but I also you know I work hard and I want to enjoy it and you know, mm-hmm. long term wise, mm-hmm. but, but it seen that influence around me it still was like, well, I'm making pretty good money. I could spend my money the same way, but I also had kids at the same time and mm-hmm. they didn't, you know, so I had yeah. to really change my mindset with that. And, uh, it, it took some time. It took really, I mean, like I said, probably about 10 years ago to really stop and say, okay, you know, time to get my shit mm-hmm. together and grow up. 
And even now here I am 45, I'm still, you know, my wife is, she's very frugal. And then she met me and did, Mm -hmm. became the opposite. And I became frugal. (laughs) It's so funny. Oh, right. So, (laughs) so you kind of like opened up her to the idea of like spending a bit. Yeah. She like helped you become a little bit tighter with your money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a good, good balancing act in a sense, you know, and it's with, with that. So it's, it definitely has helped me because I'm, you know, the scarcity mindset definitely is, isn't, it still feels like it still wants to creep back in my brain, but at the same time, mm. I'm also like put my walls up. So like, you know, uh, that's not coming back. Mm-hmm. I definitely have a, a fulf- fulfilled many needs that I have through my business. But for a long time, it was always like, well, I could just go make another pipe. I'll just go sell another pipe, you know? And then my power mm-hmm, bill would right. come due and I'm like, I'm not selling any pipes. What the fuck? And then my power just turned <laughs> off. You know what I mean? And that's yeah, like the worst thing yeah. you can deal with as an artist. And that's things I've talked about in the show is like, there's nothing worse than, than being a creative standing at your torch and you're freaking out because your fucking power bill is about to get shut off and you're like scrambling to sell stuff. And then you end up underselling your work because you need that money, yep. you know, in the end. And it's just, a, mm-hmm. it's a, you know, like the whole, I guess the snake bite its tail kind of mindset where it's just like, you know, it's just, you just go in these circles mm-hmm. and you're just chasing your tail over and over and over and over again. And you never get anywhere because of it. Cause you just keep selling yourself short because you keep saying this mentality of like, Oh, I'll just go sell a couple more pipes, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's a, I don't know. It's the, it's really easy to fall into that trap of just being like, Oh, I could just like make some pipes and then make some more money. And then it doesn't like really kind of sink in that, there should be some amount that gets put away also so that you're not just making another pipe to make more money, to make another pipe to make more money Mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like you've done a lot of work though on yourself to kind of like understand where you are coming from, like your money mindsets and what you want to do with yourself and your relationship with money. Yeah. Big time. Absolutely. Yeah, like I've, I've never been one to have credit cards, you know, that kind of stuff. Like I've never really had debts per se, but I've also had my car repossessed mm. twice because I just like, oh, I'll go sell some pipes and I'll pay, make my car payment. And the next thing I know, I'm like three months behind and my car's getting towed at fucking six o'clock in the morning and I go outside and have no car to get to work with, you know, kind of bullshit. Yeah. You know, oh, Jesus. Yeah, it's stupid. That's some bullshit. Yeah, it's fucking. It's it's just mm-hmm. stupid. So and, and and I know that. Like I've I, for me, I've I'm one. I'm the kind of person like I could teach you all kind of stuff. But I may not put that like my old me was, and I may not put that into action. You know, like with the with the business, my 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 basic business model, which I've I've taught for a long time, that is, the glass business is a very simple business to run. It's not very complicated. Mm-hmm. You have minimal overhead. Mm-hmm. So I take this you yeah. know this hundred percent number and I break it into fourths, which is basically like a 30, 30, 10 type of thing. Where it's like, you, oh, okay, know, yeah. you know, 30% you pay yourself, 30% goes to supplies to replace what you need to pay for your glass. And then 30% goes into savings to pay for whatever. And then you can take that 10% and you mm-hmm. put it in somewhere that you never touch as your emergency fund. Yeah. And you grow that, you know, slowly, you know, you can adjust your numbers as needed, but it, it works. Yeah. And it, and I just didn't put that into action. I taught it on this show for a long time and I just never took it into action. So for me going to Las mm. Vegas next month is going to be a huge kind of launching point for myself as far as like that oh, yeah? goes. Cause I'm, I'm going there for my first time ever doing a trade show for one. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, ex- I'm going there to expect to make oh, a ton of money. This will be your first trade show. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well shit, man. That that's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I'm stoked. So it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I definitely feel like it's the, the next phase and chapter of my life as an artist is, is about to, that, that, mm-hmm. that page is in front of me right now. And I'm excited for it because I know I'm going to go there and have success and then come back with that success. And my wife and I are like, okay, so let's get some of your debts paid off because she has her own little credit mm-hmm. card debts, you know, and then really take this seriously. And, mm-hmm. you know, I've never been a starving mm-hmm. artist per se, but mm-hmm. I have been an artist that had his power turned off. <laughs> and his car repossessed a couple times yeah you know, which is stupid a couple things yeah so <laughs> yeah eventually we all grow up what but, do you think you was know. the um what do you think that was the triggering event that got you to be more aware of your money and how you react with it uh was it having kids yeah so i had i had a hearing to go to for a child support hearing for adjustments that we had made 
And I was literally like 30 mm -hmm. seconds late because I went to the wrong courthouse. Like I read the paperwork wrong. So I went to the clear across mm -hmm. town and missed this court date. And it was so I had a, a, a writ uh, or whatever that's called for my a warrant for me to get arrested. Right. Because I missed this fucking court date. Oh, my dear God. Yeah. So I was so mm -hmm. pissed. Mm -hmm. So that was that was really a eye opening moment for me. Like I had cash put aside and I was happy that I had it put aside and I also had to go borrow a little bit of money on top of that to make sure that I was able to pay this when I was going to go to jail. Because if I paid this money, I wasn't going to go to jail. I would just come right out immediately, which is what mm. happened. Mm. But it was definitely that was like mm -hmm. the, the eye opening. Like, all right, this is fucking bullshit. You shouldn't be in this situation anymore, much less reading the paperwork wrong. It, you know, the whole thing. So it just made me really just mm -hmm. think like, you know, I need to just slow down and pay attention mm -hmm. and take some shit seriously not everything in life is a fucking joke you know yeah and then i quit smoking yeah. pot for like a year and a half too which really helped kind of get my mindset back into a, a good place mm -hmm. clear that fog as we talked about you know? <laughs> literally yeah, right <laughs> <laughs> there you go yeah. but yeah so and it's and kind I, of interesting how those events happen in our lives yeah like, it's always something mm -hmm. yeah and so it's i went like, Go ahead. Oh, so I met my wife at Disney. It's, it's her being a guest. So, oh. so she, you know, she mm -hmm. was in town visiting. So she's a huge nerd of, of the parks and stuff, and so am I. So if new things come out, she wants to rush off and go get it because I have this great discount. And me being the man and the relationships that loves to spoil my wife, I usually say, yeah, no problem. You know, like we had mm -hmm. when we were reopened from COVID, we had 50% off merchandise. And it was off Dooney and Burke bags, like you name it. So we spent several thousand dollars over like two weeks buying merchandise. We also bought Christmas presents oh my and God. you know other things like that. But it was like our big splurge. And I told her like this is our big splurge. And then from here on out, maybe here and there we'll get some stuff that we need. But you know, every once in a while I'll surprise her with something new. But it's you know we both have definitely tightened the reins on because it's, it's it's easy. Uh -huh. You know, it's easy just to go be like oh yeah, you know. Oh yeah. You know, then once the wallet's like cranked open, it just stays open for some reason, and and mm -hmm. it's really hard to shut it back again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I agree. And I've never been one to have like need retail therapy, you know. But mm -hmm. you know, with my my wife, but then I, you get into a habit, you know. And yeah, and, and yeah. that's not a habit that you want to want to like have long term. <laughs> exactly, like going to the drive through of like Starbucks every day because you want your fucking whatever because that's what you like to have every day, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I don't know, like just the little things like that. Like a lot of people like to rail on, like, why do you get a latte every day? It's like, well, you know what? I love this one, this one way uh, somebody put it. It's like, you know, if you replace your coffee in the morning with green tea, studies show that you can um, reduce by 98% all the fucking joy that you have in this life. <laughs> Uh, that's hilarious <laughs> so you know what if it's if, if you need that latte for like that moment is in for your mental health that's money well spent Agreed. All right? yep and, and know, i do still like, do that <laughs> absolutely but i know for myself because i'm a very avocado toast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, i'm a very routine person like once my routine starts it's like it just a new thing and then when something gets in the way of my routine it takes like two weeks to get that routine going again and for a long time my routine coming into work was stop at the dunkin donuts or the starbucks and get a coffee on the way in mm -hmm. you know and i was already spending 600 bucks a month in gas because of my commute so it was like you know adding that extra 50 bucks a week on my five dollar coffee i was getting it was like you know definitely uh yeah it added up but like you're saying yeah that adds up once in a while that adds up you know do what you gotta do yeah yeah Exactly. I mean, I mean, the real thing when it comes to like controlling your spending is just to make sure your money goes to what actually is important to you. Mm -hmm. um, like, don't just spend money frivolously, spend it on things that actually like bring you joy or at least cover your ass. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, that bring you joy that helps your mental health that really like live into what really matters to you. So yeah, I'm definitely not a proponent of like cut everything that's fluff out of your budget. Like, no, no, that that's how you not stick to a budget. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> that's how you go all like, I hate this. I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah, 
not sustainable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like the, when I was back in the day, I, I dropped a bunch of weight and got myself in shape right before my divorce I had. And uh, the guys mm-hmm. that I worked out with, they were always, their mentality was like 70% of your daily intake should be healthy carbs and calories and fats and stuff. But the other 30%, mm-hmm. have a Snickers, have a, have whatever. But, you know, mm-hmm. don't make it the opposite. Don't have Give yourself that grace, man. Yeah, you have to. Yeah. And then you have your cheat days, but, exactly. you know, you got to have that kind of stuff because otherwise, you know, for mental health, you just, uh, you know, you cut all the sugar out of your mm-hmm. system. And the next thing you know, you're eating four pounds of sugar and a bag of fucking whatever, you know. Yeah, you got to watch out for those habits and especially Doritos. You just got to watch out for the Doritos. <laughs> yeah, <my God. laughs> That's why I don't go grocery shopping. Because uh, I will buy those things. Family size. <laughs> yeah. You know, I have like once in a while, like considered like, what would I do? What would I do if I expanded this line of like cat gravy boats that I have? Uh, but oh, it just sounds like so much work. Like it was already just like a ton of work getting that up and running and, and automatic. But like adding anything else in is just sounds really... Whew, sounds like a lot. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it goes with anything new. Anyways. Yeah, well, it's been fun chatting with you. I can sit here and talk your ear off on that. I actually got to get out there and get myself on the torch. Okay, and, uh, sounds good, begin man. my late night here in the studio. Um, but before we let you go, if you want to give any, you know, give us a, just a little bit of a parting piece of advice on uh, anything, really, you want to give, whether it's on finances or just life in general, mm-hmm. and then also where we can find you out there in the world of cyberspace. Well, I would say that what has really helped me in making any decision that's a really big one, especially financial decisions, but if you're faced with a big decision to just not let yourself go down that spiral of this, that, pros, cons, et cetera, et cetera, to just stop and close your eyes and take a big deep breath and just feel your body. What does it feel like? How is it reacting? And let that inform your decision. Heck yeah. 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 It's great advice. And then the uh, cyberspace info. Cyberspace info. Uh, let's see. I am at whisperfinancial.sh. Um, I am on Instagram as Gingerella Glass. That's my old glass handle, and uh, that's pretty much where you're gonna find me out in the interwebs. Okay. Those two right there. Oh well, Batten, if you want a puking cat gravy boat, you can go on Amazon, look up the puking cat gravy boat, and it'll come right up there. Heck yeah, y'all yeah, have that link in the show notes for sure, and we'll be showing my for wife. Sure, man. Ah, nice. Absolutely. Sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Well, before we, uh, I'll say I'll do a little outro, and then we'll uh, say goodbye us off the air. Cool. So, yeah, so hang on one second. So I hope you all enjoyed this conversation, and thanks so much for everybody who has held on for the last six months, uh, as I've not recorded or posted any episodes. Uh, it's definitely taken some time to get things rolling, but here we are, 2022. It's uh, time to really think about getting your financial house in order if you have not yet ever done it, and definitely hit up Ginger, take her free Thursdays uh, where she was uh, saying you could call and get a hold of her, take full advantage. And then uh, if you get advice, then take her on as your advisor. Cause I know uh, this is a new year for her and she will be uh, ready to take on all kind of new clients, especially us pipe makers who need all the help in the world with all kind of things. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> True yeah. that. Yeah. So that being said, thanks so much for tuning in. Take care of yourself and we'll mm-hmm. talk to you soon. Peace out. Bye. Thank you.